Hi guys, hello everyone. My name is Kayla Wallace. I'm a Howard University student, political science minor, poly PR major um, from New York, and welcome to the politics uh, series of our seminar series. And my co-host Mackenzie is going to introduce herself. Yes, hi, thank you, Kayla. My name is Mackenzie Bilio. I am a junior at the University of Florida, graduating in 2022, and I'm super excited to be here today. I am the Vice President of Membership uh, for the Association of Media Professionals at the University of Florida. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and start to introduce our panelists from Howard University. Our first pa panelist is Cameron Trimble. Cameron serves as the National Director of African American Paid Media at Biden for President. Prior to that, Cameron worked at Precision Strategies, the agency that led Barack Obama's election and re-election, where he provided strategic communications consultation to corporations, nonprofits, and national advocacy campaigns. In 2018, Cameron founded Hip, Hip Politics Inc., an organization and podcast network focused on educating, engaging, and mobilizing the political power of the hip hop generation. Hip Politics has hosted dozens of events that have registered voters and brought together hip hop artists and insiders with national and local community organizations, political candidates, and voter empower empowerment campaigns. And Cameron is a proud and active alumnus from the Howard University. Crystal Knight is the political director for Priorities USA, the largest Democratic presidential super PAC in Washington. Crystal has previously served as a statewide political director for a U.S. Senate race and on Hillary for America 2016 campaign. She received her master's degree in international public policy at University College London and also graduated with her degree in journalism from the Howard University. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you, Kayla, for introducing our HD panelists. We have two panelists from the University of Florida today. Firstly, we have Erica Lowe. Erica is the Deputy Communications Director for House Majority Whip James E. Clyburn, who is the highest ranking African American in the U.S. House of Representatives. And prior to joining House leadership, Erica served as Deputy Communications Director and Press Secretary on the House Financial Services Committee under Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Some of her earliest professional experiences in Washington, D.C. include a top-tier public affairs firm, formerly known as the Podesta Group, the 2013 Presidential Inaugural Committee, and even the Obama White House. She received her bachelor's degree in public relations and education from the University of Florida. So welcome, Erica. <laughs> Secondly, we have Christian Pierre Canal. Christian serves as a legislative assistant in the office of Congressman Al Lawson. Prior to serving in this current role, he served in the office of former United States Senator Bill Nelson of Florida. He is an alumnus of the Bob Graham Center Tallahassee Internship Program, the Public Policy and International Affairs Fellowship, and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Internship Program. Christian is a second generation Haitian American hailing from Lehigh Acres, Florida, and he earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Florida in 2015. Please welcome Christian. And last, but certainly not least, we have our moderator for today's event, Jonathan Lovitz. Jonathan is a nationally recognized LGBTQ business and public policy advocate, and he currently serves as the senior vice president of the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce, where he serves as both national press secretary and head of advocacy and political work. Jonathan is a regular commentator on MSNBC, CNBC, NPR, The Advocate, and Bloomberg. He has also served as a keynote speaker for the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Treasury, the United Nations, the Trevor Project, and much, much more. He graduated from the University of Florida, where he was named Outstanding Young Alumni in April 2018. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Mackenzie uh, and Kayla. Fantastic. You know, you interns are our future bosses. So we just sit here in awe and just hope you're really nice. You know, we're, we're, we do a good job so that you hire us someday and take pity on your elders. Um, thanks for all your hard work. And we look forward to seeing both of you shine. Welcome to everyone watching us and to these four outstanding panelists. I am just uh, in such awe of, of all of you and your incredible careers and the work you've done inspiring other young people to follow in your footsteps. So I'm really excited to chat today. Day. Um, I want to get started right away with, I think, one of the most burning questions, which is, you know, your superhero origin story. How did we get here? Um, let's start with you, Crystal. Tell us about your journey into politics, and then we'll get into some, 
the nitty gritty about what it means to your life. Sure. Thank you for the question, Jonathan. And I want to thank the um, organizers of this event for inviting me to speak today. Um, my journey into politics was non-traditional. I actually um, went to school for journalism in my undergraduate degree. And I worked as a journalist at Voice of America for two years and then really got interested into politics because of that job. When I was working at Voice of America. What is Voice of America in case anyone doesn't know? Sure. So Voice of America, the most simplest way for me to explain it, it's the American version of the BBC. Nice. So when you think about, right, so that's pretty, pretty simple, straightforward. We do international news. Um, it's not seen here in America because it's produced mm -hmm. for other countries. Um, but part of what I was learning on that in that role was about international policy and politics. And I decided to go to graduate school to actually get an international policy degree. And then from there came back to DC and began working in politics. Um, began right here in Washington, DC, um, first volunteering for former mayor Adrian Fenty and later serving as a field organizer on his um, reelection campaign. That is fantastic. So you've been a little busy. Uh, <laughs> all four of you are so busy, which is amazing. Um, let's go to you, Christian. How about your journey into politics? Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, everyone, for having me. I guess I want to start by just saying uh, to uh, Kayla McKenzie and all the students that put this together, you're way ahead of, um, I can't speak for anyone else, but you're way ahead of me when I was in college uh, for doing this. Um, I think about this question a lot, and I guess the short answer is a mixture of watching uh, CNN growing up with my dad and kind of doing all the leadership stuff in, in high school. Um, but over time, um, kind of those two things really started me to kind of ask what my passions are. Um, and it's always kind of been for public service, um, leadership, kind of organizing my communities. And as I've gotten older, that's shaped into policy and politics. And mm -hmm. um, for any of the students that are, are listening, sometimes it, it feels like what, you, what you're doing might seem a little, I don't want to say easy, but a little like, oh yeah, I'm in this club and you know, like, I'm just doing this and I'm joining all these clubs. And I'm in all these office, you know, office positions. Um, it, it usually means that your passions are driving you. And, and so fortunately, um, you know, for the past nine and five years, um, those passions have kind of driven me up to the positions I'm in, uh, I'm in now. That's amazing. That's a great journey. We're going to talk more about that too. And I think it's going to be great to talk about sort of the difference between policy and politics uh, and how as much as we have them sort of inextricably linked now, maybe they weren't always so. Um, Absolutely. You know, knows the ins and outs of that pretty well from, from campaign life is Cameron. Cameron, how did you get uh, from school to where you are now into this life of politics? Uh, yes, I, I would say I have a, I also have a very non-traditional path. I went to school and went to Howard to actually be a doctor, uh, was pre-med and, but I caught the bug for real, for real, um, by being involved in student government and different, um, mm -hmm. and also just being in Washington, DC, you're obviously steeped in the nation's capital and politics and whether it be volunteering at marches or seeing so many different act, seeing so many different groups, uh, come together on the mall in front of the White House, whether it be protesting or in support. Uh, I think I, that's really what I caught the bug, but I didn't really get into politics until my early 20s. I actually started medical school and then got my first kind of marketing and communications job and and then uh, really dived head, head first into politics uh, during the 2008 Obama campaign. And I haven't looked back since. Mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. Um, and now last and certainly not least, ending on a gator, Erica, tell us about your journey and how you ended up in the Whip's office. Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, that, yeah. was my <laughs> that was my motivation. Um, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do in college. You know, I was in the J school. Um, I was active in public relations. I knew I wanted to do something exciting. I knew I wanted to do something unpredictable, um, but I couldn't figure out what that was. I had no idea. Um, I was getting closer and closer to graduating. My parents were like, well, you're going to grad school. Like, that's just that. And I was like, well, what is it that I can do to make them like let that dream go um, and still be appeased and okay? And getting a White House internship was it. So <laughs> I applied to the White House internship. Um, you know, thankfully I got it. Um, I moved to DC and the rest was history. I, I never looked back and I, there has not been a dull day since. 
That's, it sounds like it. It sounds like all four of you have had much of a dull day since school. Um, speaking of, let's, let's sort of look back before we talk about looking forward and advancing careers. Let's talk about our college days, um, both Howard and UF. Uh, I want to hear about your experiences on campus, um, growing sort of your, your personal network, which maybe did or didn't become your professional network. Um, I know not a lot of us were necessarily taught some of those skills until we were thrown into the working world, but how, what did you take away from college? And maybe, especially for our outstanding students on the line, what do you really wish you were told just before graduating or maybe even freshman year? So talk a little bit about that experience and sort of the things you wish you knew. Anyone wanna go first? Sure, I, I can yeah. definitely take, I would say my, from a network standpoint, um, things that I learned in school, being involved in student government. So yes, kudos to all the students that put this together or the students that are also watching online, uh, really kind of keeping your eyes and ears open. Mm -hmm. uh, and college offers you that opportunity to kind of go and test a lot of things out and at least start to, start to see and model where you would like to go. And from a network standpoint, I can honestly say, and Crystal knows me personally, like literally every, every single job I have has either directly or indirectly come from a Howard, a Howard, another fellow Howard alum along every path from to where I'm at right here um, with the Biden campaign all the way to my first Obama job and everything in between um, has either directly a Howard alum kind of put me in contact mm -hmm. or put me directly in contact or put me in contact with the person who who got me that job. So I, my my advice and I wish someone did actually tell me, tell this to me and I, I, I kind of stuck with it was uh, that these are going to be lifelong friendships and lifelong relationships that you should cherish and, and nurture. And um, I, I, I literally took that to heart and being in student government got the opportunity to meet a lot of people. And so over time uh, and as in my adulthood, I've still kind of nourished and cherish those relationships. So that, that is something I would tell everyone literally try to meet, meet those that you can and start to develop relationships. Um, not just in your close friend circle, but around your campus, because you you never know where you'll meet them later in life. And you're never going to work. You know, you you very well uh, think you know. Well, like you, you you probably have assumed your whole uh, social network would be nothing but doctors. Uh, and then by branching out and meeting a whole bunch of new people with new ideas and new experiences, it probably helped you grow. So I'm curious, who else has an experience like that? While you were on campus, it sort of opened your eyes to the power of really being engaged with everyone you meet. Because, like you said, you never know when you're going to run into each other up and down that ladder in the future. Crystal, oh. are you going to go next? Go ahead, Crystal. Oh, I was going to say really want to ditto what um, Cameron said. I think the the power of the network at Howard mm -hmm. is very strong. And, and so we see it on a national stage right now through um, the vice presidential nominee, Kamala Harris. Um, but I think I was also involved in student government while I was at Howard. Also, a lot of social groups at Howard yeah. that really engage the student electorate in politics. I would like to to think that Howard is very much a social justice oriented school, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think there's there's not a place that I've been socially or professionally where I haven't been able to run into an alum of the school who's been helpful. And I think that's what's most important to me. I cherish the memories that I had those four years at Howard because it really did prepare me for where I am now. I think the other thing that Howard has helped prepare me was to hustle hard. And that's yeah. something I always want to leave with people is that no matter what school you attend, um, hopefully you're getting something that will be a life skill that's transferable, not only professionally, but in, in your personal and social realm of, of life as well. And Howard definitely taught me on the first day, like you have to hustle for anything that you want. No one is going to give you anything. You're not guaranteed anything just because you matriculated through this school. And so that's the thing that I appreciate. And when I yeah. meet other alum, I see the hustle in them as well, because we went through the same thing to get where we are. That's amazing. And yeah, and especially in an HBCU when you're dealing with so many uh, you know, rich family histories and deep connections. It's really, it's powerful to even, because you're then tapping in everybody else's network, which is so incredible. Um, that, that's awesome. Uh, Erica Christian? Yeah, I mean, you know what they say, the Gator Nation is everywhere. Um, and I, I have yet 
to go anywhere where I have not encountered a gator or someone who knows a gator or someone who's a gator fan. We have all, I mean, people have come up to me if I have my gator paraphernalia on and they'll start chomping and I'm like, what are you doing? And then I remember, oh, the gator nation really is everywhere. We've all had um, so, a moment, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the network is strong. The network has been incredibly helpful. In fact, um, I did an internship shortly before the White House internship when I first moved here. And it was actually because I was working in the U.S. president's office and um, I had kind of cold emailed and met the director of government relations, Melissa Orth, who I think is Mm -hmm. still at the University of Florida. She's an excellent contact if you're interested in politics. And she put me in contact with the lobbying firm um, who represents the University of Florida at the time. It was the BGR group. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, they were huge Gator fans and, you know, UF was a client, so they kind of had to be as well. Um, And they gave me a great opportunity out here. So the network is strong. The network is real. There are people in Tiger Hall. I assume it's still called Tiger Hall, the administration building um, that are very and heavily involved in politics and can be very helpful if you just shoot them a note. And hold on to that thought, because I want to talk, we're going to get into that in a second about sort of the the leap from school to the early parts of a career. And I want to come back to that in a second, Erica. But Christian, tell me a little bit more about your your experience in school and sort of how it launched you. So I guess, I mean, I completely agree with what everyone else said on the panel. So I guess a quick lesson I want to share kind of the almost exact opposite of my experience, because I I can't speak to our Howard alum, but I know Jonathan and Eric are well aware that... um, U.S. organizations and kind of like the hierarchy and making it to these various student government or, you know, Florida Blue Key or Right Seat and Board of Managers, it you can it can really get into your head, right? You can, you can really get caught up in, you know, regardless of what, you know, you might see on our LinkedIn's, I think the most important thing that I learn and something I try to tell students nowadays is that um, you really don't fail ever in college none of if you don't make an organization it's not a failure yeah matter of fact the most important lesson is that you should turn those into lessons into experiences you know when you are going to be applying for you know possibly interning for for cam come january you know him not seeing an organization um on your resume isn't going to be what might or may not make uh your ability to become an intern but what really is going to help you succeed is those lessons that you learned you know when people say you know tell me about a time that you failed that sometimes is more important than a time that you succeeded. Um, and so that was something I had to kind of struggle with. And sometimes the most meaningful experiences I had in college wasn't um, necessarily the moments in organizations and, and kind of at the, cl- like in, not at the clubs, but in the clubs and the extracurriculars. <laughs> um, but it was really, you know, getting to know people sometimes outside or like, hey, you know, I didn't do too well in that interview or, you know, I dropped the ball being chair of this, organization and, and that matters just as much. So I think that's the, the one lesson I want to take away, uh, give you all with that one. That's such a great point. I'll add too. I mean, I remember my UF years taught me more than anything else. If there is no door, build one. Uh, be, no one, you know, you, they don't let someone, you know, just because you don't see the job listed on the website or the internship you want, use LinkedIn. Like, you know, like Erica said, call up that lobbying firm and be like, look, I know you don't have anything open. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. How can I help? Um, I, you know, b- build those doors was such an important, and I'll, you know, as, as for me going sort of into our next question, I, I was a theater graduate before I got into, uh, politics as a life. And so all of those lessons I learned about reading a room and carrying your voice and working collaboratively with people who you don't know, but have to do a great project with, you know, right out of the gate. Those were all things I got in the theater school that I immediately brought over to my work in journalism and politics and everything else. So broaden those horizons beyond your major. Um, I'm just sad Cam didn't, you know, get prescription power these days. It's the only thing (laughs) brought with him from from medical school. Um, But I want to ask you sort of about that transition and with all these lessons learned that you've all shared, are internships the way in? Are work studies the way in or is just starting to pound doors and, and get your name out there, especially sort of in this new paradigm we're in with COVID where we're all, we're all meeting like this virtually. Does building that body of work in person matter as much anymore? And I know sort of your experience even just a few years ago might be different than students today. But what do you think as you're all probably looking and hiring young people to come work with you? What's that next step like, especially in this crazy digital Zoom internship world? Well, my mantra is to show up, follow up, and don't give up. Um, and I think that that's what I've done from from the beginning. And I know showing up is a little different now. So you, you may have to show up virtually or via phone. Um, but for me, you know, 
particularly when, well, I'll even talk about how, when I moved to DC, I moved to DC because I was waitlisted for the White House internship. So I decided that I was gonna show up um, and, fortu- and that's not easy for everyone. Fortunately, I had family yeah. who lived here um, and I was going to, to meet with anybody who would meet with me. I made sure that as soon as I got back to a computer, I followed up with my resume, I followed up with thank you notes and I didn't give up. And because I didn't give up, it worked out. And I, that's been the general trend of my career um, up to the whip's office. I love that. And I have to say that it just is it's deeply personal, resonant with me. My husband who works at her NBC News was the same way. was like, no, 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 you don't seem to understand. I, I'm an intern here now. Right. <laughs> you a choice. I right. work here now. We'll yeah. figure out what I can do for you, but I'm good and you need me and let's figure this out. I love that, Erica. Who else? Like what, t- um, uh, your your sort of journey through internships to get where you are, how would you help someone today sort of frame that journey? I um, I'm, I was a non-traditional intern again, because I, like I said, I started in medicine uh, and then I transitioned from medicine to marketing. And actually my first marketing comms jobs were really with restaurants and throwing parties. And I'm, I tried to figure out, like, how do I translate the skills? And, and Crystal's laughing because she's been to a few, she went to a few of them back in the day. But um, I I would also say it's the it's it's a little bit of the humility factor and willing to grow and learn. Like I, I got my first job was an internship. Um, well, I, I was a community organizer on the Obama campaign for like the last few months. And then I said my, it w- we flipped uh, Kent County, Michigan from red to blue. So. It went well. All right. Uh, uh, it went very well. But um, what I did after that, I set my sights and I said, hey, I really want to work on Capitol Hill. I'm willing to do whatever. And it actually, t- it, no, you have to have a little bit of patience, patience and persistence. I probably conservatively went on 50 different coffees, had a ton of different emails, uh, email chains, try to work every connection. I ended up volunteering, um, but Howard reached out, uh, a person reached out and said, hey, Congressional Black Caucus has their annual legislative Mm -hmm. conference coming up. Mind you, this is months later. Hey, would you just like to volunteer and help in the green room with these various members of Congress just to make sure they got water? They're going to the stage. We just need extra hands. I'm on it. I make connections with different members of Congress and some of their senior staff. And then when you go and follow up and have a coffee with them, oh, I remember you from the green room. Little do they know, um, I was unemployed for two months trying to figure it out and just trying to land that internship. And then rather than, even though I had I had coming from full-time jobs prior to that, I had to also have the kind of humility to say, you know what, I'm willing to take, luckily it was a paid fellowship, but it was a thousand bucks a month in DC. Yeah. So I had to have a part-time job, really hustle before I really worked myself in. And mind you, I'm in my, I, by then I was in my mid to late twenties. So You've got to have some humility if you're really going after what you want, especially in politics. And when you're there, do it all and learn all you can. Like mm-hmm. one of the most valuable opportunities is either an intern, uh, an intern or a staff assistant, a deputy, uh, anything with assistant next to you means you have an opportunity to be there, here, learn from everyone else, and your butt's not on the line. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you can learn so much so you can learn how to when you when you are given the opportunity to to advance. Yeah. Now you've learned from from your predecessor. You can figure out how to do it a little bit better and you can meet all the context and the people you need. You need. So really, I would say that humility, that hustle and that patience and persistence. I yeah. love that. And I also I just and, and and the sort of omnipresence too. like be in those rooms. If you can get into those you know, show up. You know, we say it about voting. Decisions are made by the people who show up. The same is true for your career. If you're not at the job fair, if you're not at the networking event, you didn't shake a hand. So, um, Christian, you were going to chime in. Quick, uh, kind of bouncing off on that with, with hustle is, is two things, especially with the theme of this panel. I think for most likely if you're if you're watching this panel, if you're part of this panel, you are a minority in one way or another. I know specifically part of this is about uh, racism and race and politics and so there are, without a doubt, barriers to entry for all of us. Um, you know, I two weeks after I got into call uh, after I graduated from college, I was at Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and that was kind of the that was the door before the door before the door that got yeah. me to really kind of become a staff assistant, as, as Cam mentioned. Um, which side note, Cam may not remember, but when he was a commons director, I was a staff assistant, and I looked up to to him and 
all the uh, other cooler CBC staffers from five years ago. Um, but CBC and other kind of organizations like that, like they're they're not everywhere, they're not everything. But what really matters is kind of that grit and that hustle. And a quick quick story is my CBCF internship ended, and I still was not. Um, employed, which is fine. The average time, I think, for employment is about six months or so. Um, fortunately, thanks to Congressman Hastings' office, I was able to kind of stay on, but it was unpaid. Fortunately, I had a cousin that lived off somewhere in Maryland, and I, I hustled, and I took the mark, and I did all these things. And the kind of gist of the story is I got into a car accident. Um, in DC, I was fine. My car was not fine. And I thought, all right, well, I'm just going to kind of stay on this couch in Maryland and then kind of take the GRE and figure it out. And I had three conversations with my mom that I'll never forget. And if I do ever get coffee with anyone in the chat, you'll probably hear me say this again. The first <laughs> one was the like, are you okay? Right? Like parent, whatever. Second one was the what happened. Um, and which just DC roads are very different than Florida. Um, and then the third one was, I think was really important was, um, you know, my mom or Congressman Hastings office kind of let me take like an extra week off of, as an intern. And I was like, you know, like, oh, well, maybe I'll just kind of go home. And my mom said, don't forget why you're here. You're here for a reason. Um, no. And it was just like, it, it, I don't know. It was shout out to my mom. Love you. Um, and, you know, two weeks later, I got hired my first job as a staff assistant. And, you know, here we are five years as of October 19th as a, as a congressional staffer. So that's really the hustle. Amazing. And I, I honestly think that when you think that you're at your lowest point or when you really think that your back's against the wall is when you, you realize you have that extra push for, for your next opportunity. So never give up. Wow. Absolutely. Crystal, Erica, I saw you both getting excited about it. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I again, I, I entered into politics in a non-traditional way and I did not do any internships. Uh, my first political job, I began volunteering on the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and I volunteered until they hired me. And so literally after um, the mayor lost his reelection, I went to the DNC and volunteered as a summer organizer until the Obama campaign started, um, his reelection campaign. And so really, I, I, I use those two stories, which are not really long stories, but just to say that I didn't have a real internship. Mm -hmm. I showed up and said, hey, I want to volunteer for this campaign. Um, and eventually that turned into a um, that turned into a job. And in both instances, it was within 30 days that I was hired. After volunteering. And so don't underestimate the ability. And I think volunteering and interning are really one and the same. But also, even if you don't have an official title, you're just a volunteer, you mm -hmm. can still add value and show that you deserve a place on the team just because you show up every day. That's fantastic. Erica, were you going to chime in one more time? I saw you, uh, oh, okay. I saw the great game. I echo what everyone. That was a hand wave or not. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things you're all talking about, you, you sort of a common thread here is all on keeping good communication, being true to yourself and sort of going after what what you've set out to do, but also being open to <laughs> being open to, yeah, I guess really pulling your sails taut so that whenever the wind comes, it's ready to catch you um, and then try that wherever that adventure takes you. Um, this is a weird time for that, even the way we're doing this. You're all meeting with people, your host, you know, you're, I, I find it so strange that we're doing things like drafting bills over Google Docs now. And I used to go into, you know, the Longworth building and sit at that Dunkin' Donuts and, you know, work on leg legislation. So how, what are some of the best practices now that you all have seen that could be great for some of our students on the line for having these meetings? You know, a lot of, a lot of times, uh, even the, the virtual coffee can feel like an interview or an audition, as opposed to just two human beings getting to know each other and what comes from it comes from it, but we've got a bond. So could you talk a little bit about how you're making this sort of crazy time work full for you and for the folks that you're potentially hiring or networking with? I personally think it's much easier to jump on the phone than it is to put on real clothes and go meet someone in person. So I'm, I'm actually enjoying this. Um, I, I think that there are people that I know of that have been more accessible. I think I'm personally more accessible. It's far easier um, for folks to just email me. And I've gotten quite a few just cold emails and I, I, I'm all about the cold email. You may not know the person, but you may know of the person. If you can get a hold of their email or you know someone who might have their email, shoot them a note, see if you'll have, see if they have time. You know, a lot of us are here because someone took a chance or someone took the time when they didn't have to. So it's incumbent on all of us to pay it forward. 
Um, so I would definitely just reach out to folks, see if they have time for a 15 minute call, maybe get a group of your friends. Um, and if maybe if all of you are interested in politics and there's a political person you wanna to talk to and ask if you can do a quick Zoom call, a lot of people will be amenable to that. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of prefer it. I want to add to what Erica said as well, and that you're, I do feel more accessible. I'd also say that um, this time has allowed me to see that it's cheaper to meet with people. I mean, if, yeah. you're working, <laughs> if you're working in a professional environment and everyone is asking you to go to coffee or to go to lunch, um, and sometimes you may feel compelled to pay for people, sometimes you don't, and maybe people feel compelled to pay for you, but this is a very low barrier entry into getting a direct contact with someone. Mm -hmm. And so that can be via LinkedIn, it could be via FaceTime, or it could be via Zoom, or like Erica said, just a simple phone call. And so I think continue to reach out to people, um, continue to just ask for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it is. I do like the fact that sometimes when people come and, and have a request, they already know something about, you know, the, the direction of the conversation that they want to go in. And two, they also know a little bit of background about the person that they're asking to meet with. I think that's helpful. It's it's very yeah. helpful when people say, oh, I saw that you did this or I see that you went here or did that. It just adds to the, the flavor of the conversation. So I would just drop that nugget and say, try to find out one thing about the person. I mean, people mm -hmm. have all their public lives now on social media um, and on LinkedIn. And I think that that's helpful when you're making a connection with someone that you don't know. Well said. Gentlemen? Yeah. Um, one thing that I would, I would mention, um, well, since I've been on the campaign in July, I, it is actually harder to meet now, but that's because just that's the nature of this job. Yeah. Um, but prior to that, and always, and even a campaign, like I am all about trying to pay it forward and help people out. Like, like I said, when I, as I explained earlier, my path was a little non traditional, and a lot of people took chances on me. A lot of people took coffees when they didn't have to. So I'm as, as often as possible, I try to make room for as many as people as I can. The, the, and I hired the person I hired to be my assistant on the campaign came from a, a girl who asked, who walked up to me on a panel two years ago, or maybe mm -hmm. two years ago, said, Hey, can I have a coffee? And I had never worked with her, got, but had great energy, great resume, taught in great references, and was able to hire her and got a few other people, people that I've had coffees with hired on the campaign, hired and hired as interns in my previous positions, um, or to work in my organization, had politics. Um, or just willing to connect them, to, uh, even if it's nothing I have personally, um, I try to be a connector around, around a lot of people and people, hey, I'm looking for a good person who does digital. I'm looking for a, a, somebody in comms. I'm looking for a good writer. And, oh, I just had coffee with this gentleman here. I just had a coffee with this, this, this young girl here and she's about to graduate. Um, literally one, a girl who I've had coffee with twice is now Jamie Harrison's deputy press secretary because she's graduating Howard early. She's graduating Howard early this this fall, and it came to mind. I asked about it. So never you, you always want to make yourselves available and try to make these make these coffees and and yeah. to, to the point. Just email people LinkedIn and also don't get offended if they don't hit you right back because you know people are busy. But um, that persistence, that humility, and that hustle does show through. Yep. And the great thing about LinkedIn is, too, it shows you more than just their work history. Like, sure. you, the fact that, oh, you went to such and such school, so did my dad, where you blah, blah, blah. Like, talk to people as human beings first, and then you'll become work colleagues later. I love that, Cameron. That's, that's, that's great. Christian, were you about yeah. to say something? And just, you know, for, for the students that are listening, if, if you ever do feel a little nervous or shy, I think just two things to remember is, you know, part of the way that I got on this panel today was, you know, being reached out by a, by a gator. Um, and um, it's just kind of the giving back. And I think as, as Cam mentioned, even people in our positions are, are, are giving back. But I think the other important thing is that like, we aren't, I guess I'll take, I think you guys are not your heads when I say this, but like, we don't really, we're not special. We don't feel special. You know, we just might be a couple of years ahead of you all. And like, there are people that we would want to get coffee with, right? And so it's really just kind of a, a change. Sure, we might have this title, but we've been in your shoes. You know, like we have kind of ambitions. We understand what it's like, you know, we're getting coffees, we're learning we're growing and so um i think sometimes there's a, a kind of sense of like yeah. i remember like my first month on the hill it's like oh like this chief you know like i can't speak to them it's like no it was, there's an open door policy and like you know it's, yeah. it's really a team um atmosphere so just kind of 
you know, we're, the majority of us, we're, we're pretty low key. And, you know, if you, if you hustle hard, you're, you're not going to not be huh. humble if, if, you, if you did it the right way, hopefully. So, yeah. Well said. Excellent. Well, several of you mentioned sort of the concept of making sure as you're going up the ladder, you reach down and pull people up with you. Paying it forward is... I think intrinsic to both of our universities, it's something that is deeply ingrained in the UF alumni network, certainly the Howard alumni network, um, creating those opportunities and those spaces for, for others uh, in our experience. And I think also particularly in this conversation as we're talking about sort of this elephant in the room series, really addressing identity and opportunity. And I, I would love to hear perspectives, you know, we're, we're, we're coming at this from a bunch of different perspectives as, as LGBTQ, as people of color, as women, as people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So looking across the trajectory of your career, how, how has identity helped, protect, possibly harmed uh, opportunities for you? And how is it helping you build an even stronger network now for opportunity and success? Erica, I want to, let's start with you. You've had the last word too many times. <laughs> How has I been, I mean, I think, so I guess I'll start with, you know, at the university, the University of Florida had a program called the Minority Mentor Program, um, where they matched you up with, with other profession, other professors, other professionals. Um, you know, I was blessed to have a, a professor in the College of Education, Dr. Tyron Butler, and she was a woman of color, which you didn't often see at the University of Florida. Um, and she really kind of set me on the path of just kind of embracing who I am, embracing, you know, being one of, I guess at the time it was maybe like 10 to 12% of the, the 50,000 population were African-American students. Um, and, and, and she, she really wanted me to kind of step into that and embrace that. And everywhere I went, she wanted me to, to, to go in with that mindset and with that mindset have a seat at the table. So when I was working in the president's office or when I was, you know, working with the Center for Leadership and Service or wherever I was, you know, I was often the only person of color at the table. And and I think that I think that because she gave me kind of the guidance of going in there with that mindset that it allowed me to to kind of offer a different perspective that people appreciated. And then going forward, and even now, sometimes I'm still the only person of color at the table, um, but I embrace that. And I think that especially now um, in, in this very racially tense moment, you know, people appreciate that perspective that you can bring. Um, and I think that it's certainly well. the diversity of ideas. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't always a thing. Uh, right? <laughs> Well, that's awesome. I'm and I'm glad that you that you had that experience. And were able to come out of it because I would imagine you're in your work now. And I want to sort of uh, continue this conversation as a thread with all of you. Is is how are you know? It's still far too often. I, even now in D.C., I see it way too often. There's often one of everyone represented at the table, as if they've you know they've gone down the checklist. And it's a bit of a burden to have to be that voice, but also at the same time you are in the room. So how do you balance that? So adding that extra layer on as we continue with this question about the identity and how it's grown your career. Christian, I, I see you laughing, so I'm putting you on the spot. Running through a lot of memories um, yeah. over the past couple of years. I guess I'd, I'd start off by, by saying um, being a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation um, intern really opened my eyes up to, like I know, especially now over the past couple of months with kind of um, the racial strife being kind of hopefully at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, but obviously the black community is not a monolith, right? And I know that, um, but when growing up where I did in Fort Myers and going to the University of Florida, which is a PWI, even if you are in diverse spaces, I think sometimes there are um, kind of the, the weight of being the token black person or the weight of being this black person or I sound different or I listen to this music um, can be really overwhelming. And I really, I really loved about my experience of being one of 40 CBCF interns that summer of 2015 with unfortunately so much happening with uh, the black community, whether it was um, Walter Scott's um, extrajudicial killing, whether it was the Charleston Nine, so much was happening was realizing that I'm a part of the community, but I'm, I'm different. I'm, you know, second generation Haitian Catholic, which was very different from people who could, you know, literally trace their ancestry back to slavery in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that really made me feel more connected to the community while also feeling proud of kind of my 
own um, intersectionality. And so with all of that, now that, you know, from being a staff assistant to, you know, working in the Senate to being a legislative assistant, I try to let everyone know, um, but especially um, the younger Black interns know that, like, you can always come to me. Don't feel intimidated or, or really anyone. And this, I think, goes beyond what side of the alley you're on within the, the Black community on the Hill. Um, and don't be intimidated by what somebody sounds like or what they look like or what they're dressing because we've walked in your shoes. Um, and we have um, unfortunately often experiences that other people won't have. Um, and I feel like I can be a little bit more candid um, mm -hmm. with that. And I guess the other thing, as we've mentioned, kind of the seat at the table, and I think for you know, Congresswoman Charlie Chisholm said it best is you know, if they don't give you a seat at the table, you know, you bring your own chair. And um, managing kind of the um, decorum of that and the professionals that takes some time, but you know, you're in the room and you have a voice, so it's really your responsibility to to use it and to make that difference. Yeah, well, well said, Cameron. You can you yeah. can. Who goes next? Yeah. Oh, Cam, Cam, but you. <laughs> go ahead, man. Oh, you sure? Oh, okay. Um, I will say because I have a good question for her afterwards. So go ahead, Cam. Okay, real quick. Uh, to that is just kind of bringing yourself in that self confidence. Uh, be in this day and age. Bring your whole self to the to the room, and lead with that, and and kind of be upfront with that. Because if that's how you come in the room, that is how people will respect you and treat you now and throughout your career. Well, well said. Yeah. Crystal, close us out on this one and then we'll pivot off because I've got a, a question. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to talk about bringing all of your identities. I think people, as people, we're layered. So, you know, I'm a Black woman. I'm a Black woman raised in the South. I'm a Black woman raised in the South <laughs> in the University. I also lived overseas for a year. I've also done a number of different things. And so I bring every single identity that defines mm -hmm. me into every single room that I enter. And that, that doesn't mean that I'm like the next person that is sitting next to me and that looks like me. It also means that I don't hide from any of the good or the bad that's happened in my life. So all the things that broke me are also the things that helped make me. Those are the things that I continue to talk about. I own my story. So I'm not embarrassed or ashamed of any of the things that have happened because I'm literally in the room making decisions um, that will help the future generations of this country based upon my experiences. And so just because something that has that maybe wasn't the most rosy thing has happened, it has literally helped me make a decision that will help better the country in the position that I'm in right now. And so I think it's important when we're talking about identity mm -hmm. is to bring all of your identities into every single room that you're in, whether they're good or bad, because they really do help you frame the conversation and they help you frame the decisions that you'll make as future leaders. Beautifully said. Um, and, and that's exactly so. And, and that framing, I, uh, I'm so glad you brought up particularly your international experience because talk about lost in translation, what we face in America in terms of discussing racial equity and opportunity and even our, our, our history is so different than how we're seen around the world. And I'm curious, um, Crystal sort of kicking off this question to everyone is, is in the course of being yourself and being present in those spaces and, and, and very likely being among uh, the few diverse people in a room, how did you deal with the potential microaggressions that came from that. I mean, I see it. For, I remember just being at UF. Uh, my best girlfriend, who's still to this day my best girlfriend, who you know she was Greek. She always uh, proud. You know, she was adamant about natural hair and all of these things. And the amount of men that would just be like, "Can I touch your hair real quick?" You do not understand what that means. How dare you? Um, like little, the most simple things like that. People don't understand how that can derail our ability to connect with one another. So tell us a little bit about that just from your personal experience. And I want to go to everyone about this because I think we all have a moment or two in our, our careers and even our education where we really said, if you really knew what, what I and my community were about, you would think twice. So. Yeah, I think when I think about microaggressions, the best way for me to handle them is to address them directly. So it's not to make a joke about, make a joke about it and kind of, you know, sweep it under the rug, but really we're always learning and relearning and unlearning things that we've been taught throughout our life. And so for some reason, people have been taught to just walk up to people and touch their hair or say things that are inappropriate. And so it's not necessarily meant for us to have a confrontation or an argument about it, but to just really share with that person and, and educate them on what mm -hmm. is the problem 
way to address a situation or the proper way to ask a question or to, uh, the proper way to talk about someone who has textured hair, for example. Um, and so we're always in a position where we can help people learn, relearn and unlearn things that they've been taught throughout their life. And so the best way for me to give advice and, and to address that is really to say to address it directly. Don't let it fester. And, and you know, you, you go three or four months down the line and you build up this resentment around a person who continues to act out or say things that are inappropriate because you haven't addressed it with them directly. Well, well said. Can anyone take, uh, take a stab? You look deep in thought on this one. No. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think you lived in experience with a man who pretty much rewrote the book on, on you know, norms in public spaces. So, you know, what, what was even that experience like to be among a political campaign that was all about flipping that narrative of, of yeah. who is and is, is not in power? I would say yes. I think um, a few different a few different ex examples about kind of flipping the narrative. Um, you've got it. it kind of goes back to my last thing. You leading it with who you are and where you are in these spaces, and I think we're we're moving we're moving into a more digital world, a more accepting world, uh, where people just kind of know more about each other. And I think it allows it allows for that change. It allows for for new things to kind of happen. So. Uh, I've seen, uh, uh, yeah, I've seen it with with uh, Barack Obama and being able to flip that. Even here, my work with uh, the Biden campaign, mm -hmm. uh, and then also um, some of the narrative spaces. Uh, I, I spend time at the National Museum of African American History and Culture as their senior public affairs specialist for their inaugural opening year, and that was an opportunity to where something that something that you thought was maybe just like a black thing because this is an African American museum really became a beacon and kind of flipped the narrative on what it meant to be a museum, what it meant to be a place of culture, what it meant to be a convening, uh, a convening force for hmm. so many cultures, uh, so many different races around the country, but literally around the world. I think that was probably one of the places where I learned the most about, I had a preconceived notion of what my job would be and what the kind of message we would be giving, but when the, the faces and, and the people you would see that were lining up for hours every day, and that you were able to kind of to help to learn a piece of American history through the African American lens um, really helped me understand what it truly meant to kind of say what would say flip the narrative and really yeah. understand that. Awesome, thank you, Erica. I've dealt with so many micro, micro and macro aggressions. <laughs> I think you know. Let me, let me just let me let me take a pause. Right, good for you. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, one that really comes to mind, I have been told so many times that I am articulate mm. or or just blatantly that I don't sound black, whatever that means. Um, and I think, you know, what has been helpful for me is just kind of flipping the question back around. Can you expound on that? You know, tell me a little bit more. What exactly does a black person sound like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what makes me so articulate? Do you do you tell other people that they're articulate? Um, you know, don't get defensive. Um, which you know is easy to do. Um, you know, I like I like to think John Lewis, um, may he rest in peace, always had a quote, keep your eye on the prize. So I, I try to remind myself that, particularly in the workplace, <laughs> sometimes it's like, you know, remember why you're here, even in college, remember why you're here, you're here to get that degree. When when you're working, when you're interning, I'm here to get this experience. Like what is it that's your end goal? And keeping that in mind, it kind of helps you have yeah. a level headed response to everything. Um, but I think often just kind of flipping it around and allow, giving them the opportunity to really think about what they said and why they said it um, has been helpful for me. Well, well said, thank you. And I think we're, we're it's great to see, I was actually listening to a, a webinar earlier today about uh, racial justice in the workplace. And we're like, I think we've put the code switch chapter of, of our life behind us. We are just done doing that. Um, because if you you cannot spend all this time and money telling me to be authentic in the workplace, but then saying, could you white it up a little bit? Could you butch it up a little bit? <laughs> Whatever it is. So with, with that bomb thrown at you, Christian, finish this one out. Tell us about you. Sort of um, thanks for giving me time to think about all the countless micro <laughs> um I've had. But I guess, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you are who you are. It's, as I mentioned, like, I know my background might be different than everyone else's, but they're different than, than mine, but we're all here for a reason. I guess a couple of things and something that I've had to really learn is that the onus isn't on the, the victim, right, of microaggression. 
to do the educating or to do the learning. Um, and I guess with that, there's there's a couple of points is, um, as, as Crystal said, yeah, address it head on. Um, but, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, or excuse me, fool me once, shame on them, fool me twice, shame on uh, on you. Did not mean to recreate President Bush's fool me once uh, misquote there. But with that being said, I, I think there's two things, because if you're on this panel, regardless of how you identify, you, you've probably dealt with a microaggression. And I think that the only way that I'd be able to, to keep my head up uh, when I leave the, the door the same way I walked in was by having a community, whether it was calling my sister, well, you know, whether it's talking to, to, to friends, you know, whether it's having some space outside of that space. Um, but I think the second thing is to remember that at least within Congress, especially within the House, is that, you know, there has been a, a critical mass towards an awareness that these things aren't right. And we have codified ways to rectify that. And racial, you know, even microaggressions can be considered at times, you know, um, harassment. And we all have to go through harassment training on the Hill. We all know that there are steps that, you know, especially certain things get taken place um, within a professional environment. And this can be also, if you are on a, at an unofficial location, let's say a happy hour with colleagues, you are still with your colleagues and that's still considered a professional environment. I think, again, some of the trickier spots, especially being um, in the policy side where I, where I meet with dozens and dozens, about hundreds of, of people from all over the country, are those meetings, are those experiences where they have never met a black person before um, or a black person working in agriculture or a black person, you know, working on nutrition policy. Um, and that's why I think it's just important to, to, you know, stay yourself grounded, remember who you are, remember that you are where you are. And something that I tell our interns every single time that they answer a phone, that they take a meeting is that they're taking the meeting with you. You're the one that it's, that's answering that phone call. You're the one that works for the Senator or the Congress member um, and use that kind of pride and what you're doing to, to keep your head up and, and, and remember that. Really well said. And I think each of you in the course of, of your answers, which were all amazing, and I'm sad we're not wearing mics of any kind for you to unclip and drop because they were all perfect for that moment. Um, but uh, one of the things you know that, that that's in the chat that I wanted to sort of address from this is each one of you had sort of addressed, don't let it derail you. Do not let somebody else's misunderstanding or, or ignorance or whatever it is throw you off. So how do we deal with that? And I think particularly for students, I wanna kind of couple this with another question we've been tackling with, which is personal identity versus sort of your professional slash social media identity, because in 2020, they are no longer a separate thing, my friends. And as we are canceling everyone for a wrong Oxford comma used 10 years ago, uh, how are we helping people avoid these things going forward, especially our, our, our you know young future leaders on this line that we're all gonna be working for someday? How do we keep those identities separate and also not lose our minds trying to just always be thinking about perceptions? I... I ain't got nothing to say about this because this, <laughs> this comes up a lot. Uh, this comes up a lot. Um, one, I'm just thankful I'm an older millennial. And so I didn't grow up like I, I didn't have Facebook and Instagram in college because I know I wasn't mature enough to probably hold back on saying certain things on Twitter and so forth. So luckily I had already I had already kind of experienced it and moved past that. But that is just not the case, and this is a different world. Um, the one thing I, 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 I try to stress so much is that anything you put on the Internet acts as if your mother, your future job owner, I mean, future job, future job anyone is seeing it, even right. if it's private, even if it's you have one follower, you've got to literally everything, whether it be a simple joke all the way to your, your political views and statements. And then the other thing is that pause before you post anything like there's nothing unless you are truly a breaking reporter, which quite frankly, most people aren't at that at that age. I'm not. But at, you're not at that age. Give yourself five minutes before you post anything. Literally, just let it sit. Let the app drop, do something else and then come back and reread it. Because that five minutes is not going to kill you. But that five minutes could be the, the difference between you getting a job and who see you never know who sees you and um and there is it just unfortunately there is no separation you can build up a social media platform you might really be into cats and like that's all you post and that's great that's that's not nothing that's going to truly probably get you in trouble but 
your views will follow you. Your and and that's just the world we live in. Mm-hmm. Your your takes will follow you. And but the the positive way you can flip that is it you can show a level of maturity that that people may not see. You can show a level of insight or show a level of adeptness to how to how to actually navigate the social media world or show that you're hey I'm able to build and gain followers um, through things. But do realize everything you post, every single thing you post. Act as if your parents are looking at it. Act as if anybody you ever want to get hired is looking at it. It, it unfortunately, but it is that serious at this point. I like that sure. as well, Jonathan. If you don't mind, the way no, you please. And I see someone. It looks like Mickey or McKay is saying, "Where is it written that an individual with a lively social life cannot be professional?" Um, I think that that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I did when I um, took my role with Emerge DC a couple of years ago, I just went ahead and created a separate Instagram account. Mm-hmm. Um, one that's open and then one that's closed. And I'm not saying that you can't have two open accounts, but one, I, I just post professional work-related information. So it's really a political Instagram page. And then my other is one that I've had for years. I don't have a ton of followers on there, um, but if I want to go to a beach, you know, even if I am posting a, a picture of myself in a bathing suit, I make sure that it's classy. I make sure right. that, you know, side boobs or too much of my behind out, just to, <laughs> for, for better um, terms. Um, but I think and, and not just not just about body image, but it's also what we're doing. Do we have yeah. drinks in our hand? Um, are we in a place that's smoky, that appears where people are smoking? Are we in places or with people that um, may not have the best reputation? And so I think one has to think about all of those scenarios and all of those things when they're posting on social media. Social media came out, at least Facebook came out for me when I was in college still. So mm-hmm. I had a long history. Um, and one of the things that has been helpful, particularly in my immediate role, I was um, background checked, meaning that mm-hmm. my job did a, a thorough scrubbing of all of my social media accounts. So things that I have I not only posted and taken down, but things that I have liked. And so I'm very cognizant about if I see a video, it might be funny or it might be inappropriate. I don't like it. I might look at it. My eyes will view it, but it's not something that I like because social media is able to capture every single thing, every single movement. And they probably even capture me looking at things that I shouldn't be looking at, but at least mm-hmm. I'm not liking those things. And so I'm very careful about that because as we continue to grow professionally, people are always looking for ways to discredit the good work that we do. And so right. if you if you have the ability to separate your accounts, do that. But also know that your public or your private account is still public, just like Cameron said. Anything that you put on here, screenshot is- lasts forever. <laughs> and you know, you probably got a hater out there who is screenshotting your stuff. So just be careful. Yeah, really well said. And those are some really great tips on that, Crystal, because it does. I mean, even especially as we're all hiring more and more digital natives for these jobs, especially in policy and comms. I want to know that you know how can I trust you to to, to manage my candidate if if all I'm seeing with you is. Uh, a lot of photos of you out on South Beach, you know, it's, we, we, so I, that's perception is everything, whether it's right or wrong. And I think as we all know in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. So if you have to constantly be telling right. people, oh, that's not what I meant, you shouldn't have posted it in the first place. Erica, let's go to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's said. I would just, I mean, I know that, you know, when you're young, you, you don't necessarily, you're not exactly sure, you know, whether it's considered professional, whether it's considered not professional. I would employ you, particularly because it's campaign season, and I think everyone probably knows and has seen the stories of people on both sides of the aisle being attacked by by their opponents. And usually that comes in the form of a post that their staffer may have posted in college. And, you know, here they are 10 years later and they're professionals and they're completely different people than they were at 19. But at 19, when they were on Facebook and Twitter and and, and whatever social media platform, they were talking about something completely different that that they never expected would get pulled up and and become offensive or, or become some sort of a hindrance to the campaign. So I would suggest that folks maybe take a look at some of those stories, take a look at some of what um, other people have been posting and what has been kind of getting folks in trouble. Um, <laughs> and maybe, maybe use that is kind of a guide because you know at 19 20 21 you may post something that seems perfectly harmless 
but 10 years from now, it can create a big problem for the person that you're working for. Um, so I would just, I would encourage folks to just use discretion um, and learn from the mistakes that we mentioned, that we're talking about here on the panel um, and the mistakes of those you might read about in the press. Can yeah. I make one quick point? Real Absolutely. Quick. We're not, every, the, we're all here and everyone here is watching because you want to get into political game. That right. has its own set of rules. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can, you can, if you want to be an influencer and get into entertainment, you want to get into a lot of other fields, you can be a lot more freer and loose. But if you want to be in politics, whether you want to be the person on the ballot or working for someone on the ballot, whether you want to be the person leading an organization or working for an organization or the spokesperson for an organization, you can't name me a single job in politics that what you put out in the public at a young age, from the moment it's on record all the way up to whenever you get that job, as they've mentioned, is not going to carry you and it has to reflect properly. So the rules of this game are a little bit different and it's kind of unfortunate, but it, and it's not fair, but it is it, that that's the game you're playing uh, when it comes to politics at any level, local, local, federal, local, state, federal or international. And a shout out to all of our PR folks listening on the line. Uh, your goal is to help us win things, not to do a triage and cleanup. So we'll do our best to keep it ready for you. All right, Christian, you've got the final word here. Uh, all no right. Answer. So I honestly think that that's an important question that you should always ask yourself. But hopefully what that means is that you, you do self-reflection and, and ask who your true self is, right? Um, really ask, you know, like, what, what does it, like, what is my personality? What is my ideology what are my values and how do i present that because at the end of the day you got to be okay with who you are and if you're kind of putting up a, a double face sometimes I, I think that can be another issue and I, I think i'll give you a a personal example is i especially growing up uh, especially at uf especially very hyper engaged in the you know in the extracurriculars there you know i think some people beyond my, my close friends were like are you real like are you a person like you're like a politician but you're 18 and i'm like no i promise like i'm, I'm more than that and I, I think that I I found a way, almost in the opposite way, and maybe some of my, my PR friends helped me in a weird way, like show that I'm more well-rounded of a person, that I have crafts and hobbies and that, you know, here's a photo of my dog. And it's not just like me wearing a suit at, at, at 18. But with all that being said, I think always know who your true self is, always know what your values are, always know that if you're gonna retweet something or, you know, like I've been a little bit more vocal on my Twitter uh, and on my social media, because we have, you know, the most historic election in our life in 28 days. But I know that what I'm sharing aligns with the people that I work for, the people that I support, you know, my my family, you know, when the current president made a comment about, you know, the, the country that my parents immigrated from three years ago, you know, I almost feel like if I don't say something in a way to let them know that, hey, you know, Christian's parents came from a country like Haiti, you know, that, that also says something. So I, I think it's just important that if you are your truest self, um, then you shouldn't necessarily have to worry about being professional versus being true. And it just takes time. And as, as Cam had, had mentioned, um, you know, you're going to develop that. But um, just be true. Be you know, always, always ask yourself. Um, all my captions, my friends take a look at, even if they're Drake quotes. Um, literally, I think the past two captions were Drake quotes, but they're they're okay. Um, and so yeah, that's that's definitely important to have that community to support what you're putting out there. Well said. And and I think we have heard about community and building that network that has your back going an hour ago to our first question. It's a perfect place for us to close out now. Um, I try to end any presentation or conversation with when I, my favorite quote ever from uh, uh, from Margaret Mead, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because it's the only thing that ever has. Well, to be in the company of the four of you and the thoughtful young citizens on this line who are gonna be our, our future bosses and the future leaders, uh, I am certainly excited about the change that's coming. So I wanna thank you, Cameron and Crystal and Erica and Christian and all the interns and teams that made this all happen. Thank you all for including us uh, in your busy schedule. Yes, go Gators, go Howard. Thanks for attending our Elephant in the Room panel series discussion around politics. Looking ahead, the next series is slated for Wednesday, October 1st, the same time, four to five p.m. Eastern, uh, and we'll focus on addressing issues in the entertainment industry and is going to be hosted by my dear friend and former uh, alumni, uh, Gator alumni, pal, LaKendra Tooks, which is going to be awesome. Joining the panel will be another set of uh, Howard and UF alumni ready to answer your questions and inspire the heck out of you, as you four certainly have. Um, tell your friends to register and don't forget to fill out the survey, which Amy has put in the, uh, in the, the chat box for a $25 Amazon gift card. 
Um, thank you again for everyone for attending. And a special thank you once more to, to Cameron and Crystal and Erica and Christian and all the alumni who are participating in these programs. And as each one of us have said throughout the day, register to vote and participate in the political process. We have jobs because we are here to fight for everyone who's on this line. So get involved, go to IWillVote.com and be a part of the process. But most importantly, pay it forward, give back to the communities that have your back uh, and let's keep taking care of each other. Go Howard, go UF. And thank you, Amy and everyone that put this together. It was really a pleasure to be with you all. Chomps as we exit, friends. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>